Hey everyone, I'm Gregory Hart. I'm the host of the Heart to Heart podcast. Today is episode number 39. I get to sit down with uh, a little bit of a legend in my opinion. I grew up listening to him on the radio. Uh, He's a baseball columnist for the Toronto Star and host of the podcast Deep Left Field. Today I'm joined by Mike Wilner. Mike, it's a pleasure to sit down with you. Um, I'm stoked to get into our chat. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Feeling a little older now that uh, you said you were growing, you grew up listening to me, but I'm uh, doing okay. Thank Good. I, um, before we get into it, like I want to, I want to dive right into to your, your experience and, uh, and your knowledge of baseball. Could you just give us a little bit of a background of yourself? Um, just as far as, uh, I, I guess, sure. I, I mean, I'm from Toronto, grew up here, born and raised, lived here pretty much my whole life. Um, I, uh, I went to University of Toronto and uh, that's where I started. I found uh, radio, uh, yep. worked for them for a bit for, uh, for the Department of Athletics and Recreation and, and sort of made my way through that into, into commercial radio and worked at 680 News and then went to the fan for 20 years and now at the Star. Um, I have two grown pretty much daughters. Um, and uh, I don't know what else backgroundy stuff do you want? No, that's great. I, I just, I wanted to see where it all started. I know I did some research on you and you, you did some, uh, some broadcasting for the 2010 Olympics. You had worked uh, as um, the radio uh, broadcaster for the Toronto Blue Jays for quite a few years now with the, with the Toronto star. Um, was it always baseball? Was baseball like the original sport that you wanted to be involved in when it came to radio or how did that get started? Yeah. I mean, baseball, baseball is, first of all, is the most fun um, to do on radio. I mean, well, I don't know. Hockey's a lot of fun too, uh, to call play by play of because it's so fast and, and uh, you, you barely get a chance to take a breath. Yeah. But, Baseball and radio sort of go hand in hand, you know, they're, they're, uh, baseball's built for the radio kind of thing. So I, I, that, that absolutely drew me, uh, from the beginning. And, and I guess the, you know, the first job I set out to get after I did, I worked a little bit for uh, the radio station at U of T in first year, um, that summer I looked for a baseball job and I wound up getting one with the Welland pirates who were in the uh, New York Penn league, which no longer exists. They were a short season, a ball team for Pittsburgh. Um, okay. So, you know, when, when I got to 680, it, I was more of like a general assignment D sort of thing. Um, I did like, I covered the Leafs and I covered the Raptors and I covered the Argos and, and the Jays and, all that stuff and some other stuff too, that was a little, um, different or, um, you know, I covered a North York senior games once, which was interesting and weird. Uh, but, but <laughs> I, so I did a little bit of everything. So I've, I've been to a lot of things, but baseball was always the, at the forefront. It was definitely always where I, what I wanted to do. So it's, wonderful that it's worked out like this was that was that always just based on the fact that as doing radio baseball is some of the most entertaining to listen to it's it's really nostalgic for me in my age listening to it on the radio because i grew up listening to it on the radio it it was it did it string from that the fact that it was just the be all end all for radio was baseball broadcasting or did this start at a younger age of just loving the sport itself i've always loved the sport but i always loved i mean when when i was growing up and I'm sure I've got at least a couple of decades on you. Um, when I was growing up, it really was only available on the radio, right? We, we would, you know, now there are 162 games televised for every team pretty much. But when I, even when I was a teenager, the game would be on TV Wednesday night, a game would be on TV Saturday afternoon and, or Sunday afternoon. And for the rest of it, you had to listen to the radio. So if you wanted uh to to know anything about baseball if you wanted to follow your baseball team there were the box scores in the newspapers the next day and the ball game on the radio at night so it really you know it's it it wasn't so much 
a nostalgic thing as it was an, an access thing. Yeah. Because you only had two ball games on a week on TV. So um, very much radio and baseball were were extremely interconnected for me as I grew up, for sure. And, and some of the best baseball moments that I've ever actually been able to listen back to, the only memory I really have of it is listening to that radio, like listening to the broadcasters um, put emphasis on what's going on in the ball game, really trying to make you feel like you're there. It gives you a goosebump sometimes going back and listening to those broadcast it just it, the way it's portrayed is just something that you can't get from television no and, and something you don't need to get from television because the pictures can tell the story right and and um radio there's no picture obviously so so the the broadcaster has to paint that picture for you and it has to like take you to the ballpark and 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 tell you everything that's going on and everything that they see so yeah, very obviously, um, it's it's a different, it's a whole different thing. I've never done a ball game on TV, um, so I, I don't know how differently I would have done it. Um, I think for me, it would have been difficult to pull back from a radio style of play by play because that's the only thing I know how to do. But at some point, they don't need you. Um, and the pictures can tell the story and you can just shut up for 30, 45 seconds and, and let, let what you're seeing yeah. show you what's happening. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure where we started on this thing, but, but I, I think it's interesting that, that you remember some radio calls and that a lot of people do too, that chances are they weren't listening to the radio at the time because uh, the overwhelming majority of, uh, the audience for a baseball broadcast is watching on television and, and the radio numbers have uh, dropped precipitously uh, over the past decade and change to the point that a lot of teams just don't care about their radio broadcast anymore. Um, but, but some of those famous radio calls become famous after the fact on highlights. Yep even though everyone saw it on TV. Yep. Completely agree. Now, now going from doing the radio full time, where, what, how are you associated? Like now you're with the Toronto star, you're doing uh columnist. So you're, you're doing more of online presence. Well, I'm, you know, there's a newspaper too. I mean, there's a, yeah. the digital stuff, right? Um, my, my online presence is the same as it's always been, I think on social media, but um, you know, as a, I guess the podcast is, is online. Absolutely. And that's, that's a weekly thing that I'm really, really enjoying, but I'm writing in the newspaper pretty much every day, which is also online too. And it's, it's really cool. I mean, I know that it feels like not a lot of people still like the having a newspaper in their hands, they want to read off their phones or, or their tablets or whatever. And that's super cool. And, um, you know, the, the star is definitely pushing digital subscriptions. Absolutely. But it's, it's also really cool to see your work sitting there in the newspaper, uh, every day. And that's, uh, I, I think that's, that's pretty amazing. I, uh, and 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 the it's almost like it's it's a weird way to relate it but my dad saved newspapers throughout some of the biggest uh things in history he had like the moon landing he's got the uh um jay's world series in 93 he's got um uh wayne gretzky retiring in newspaper form and it's almost like now that's become like nft stuff i don't know any anything about that stuff nor do i really care that much about it but it's just so much nicer to have that physical copy in your hand. So that's where I kind of relate to the newspaper. It's it's kind of hard now because any radio or any um, newspaper companies obviously got to try and push um, going digital or else they're just going to probably fall to the wayside or or go extinct, really. But it, it, it's 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 just looking over your career and hearing all about it and doing the research on you this coming this past couple of weeks. It's it's very exciting to see that you got to live your dream and, and be associated with the Toronto Blue Jays and still be able to interview the players, which is just like a dream of mine someday to be able to, to, be able to just talk to a Jays player uh, about their career and their, and their time at the Jays. Um, how much has the team meant to you over the past few years or the past decade? 
uh, in your in your case, and um, and 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 how much do you try and associate with the Jays now? Well, I mean, it's it's been, you know, it it's been a central part of my life for over twenty years now. Like since I I joined the broadcast in two thousand and two, so um, I did that for. 18 seasons and this is my third season now with the star but i mean even before that the first jays game i covered was in 1988 so um you know this is really my 35th Unreal. season covering the blue jays in 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 some way shape or form and so it's um you know it's a it's a real attachment um it's i've been at the dome probably more often than I've been anywhere except my home in my whole life. Um, and I, you know, you're not a part of it, but you're a, a part of a conduit to it. And you're part of the way that uh, the fans experience it. And that's, that's a, a really important thing. Um, but yeah, you know, when you, when you do the job, you can't really be a fan anymore. But for sure, it's it's great when they do well, it, and and uh, not as certainly not as much fun when they don't. Um, I don't ride the roller coaster like the fans do. Like you know, one day they're terrible and they're never going to win another game, and the next day they're going to win a World Series. I you know I've I've been around too long to fall into those traps. But for sure, the 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 franchise, um, the team. It's it's been a massive part of my life for most of my life. Now, now, what do you what do you, how do you feel about the twenty twenty two Blue Jays? Like compared to what we saw last year, being in Tampa for a few years due to COVID, how are you feeling about this year's season? I mean, right now, uh, as we talk at the end of July, I think they're they're in really really good shape. Um, it's been it's been a weird season. It's been an up and down, and and you know when you fire a manager midstream, that's something that um, generally comes with a great lack of success. But they fired a manager while they were in a playoff spot. They've been in a playoff spot every day this season, um, and which you know to, to to see the reaction of some of the fans and and um, the back and forth that I've had, it's it's crazy to to see the. I don't know. I think the level of entitlement of, of people um, to, to say, well, they've, they're in a playoff spot and that's not good enough for a team that hasn't made the real playoffs in six years. And, and at one point went over 20 years without making the playoffs. Uh, I think they're in a really good spot right now. And I think that they are one of the best teams in the game and haven't really I mean, as we speak, they've won seven in a row and nine out of 10. So maybe this is them hitting their stride. Uh, they're, they're not this good. Obviously, no team is. But they're good enough to win that first wild card. Um, I, I don't know that the division is still in reach with, the, with how big a lead the Yankees have built. Uh, but if they win that first wild card and they have that home series um, to start the playoffs, I think they're they're in really really good shape, and you can't ask for much more than this. I agree, and 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 to your point of uh, not getting caught up like the fans and always um, going from you love them, you hate them, or you think they're going to be the best team of all time and or or the worst team this year. I I, I try not to get caught up in it either, just because baseball is such a there's so many games in a season. It's very hard to count anyone out at at, at, at really most points of the season. Do you think at, the, at that point of the season it was the right call to fire or to, to release Montoyo? Yeah, you can say fire. They fired him. Um, I think I think it was. I it caught me by surprise. Um, there's no question about that. I didn't think things had gotten as bad as they had gotten. But in talking to a few people uh, in the you know the the immediate days after the firing it became really clear that it, it was not working uh, and, and that, that a change was necessary. And uh, it's too bad. You know, I think that um, I don't think there's a single person in that room who doesn't love Charlie Montoyo and think he's an absolutely wonderful guy and, and definitely a very good baseball man. But 
um, it, it just, it wasn't working. And when, um, when things, uh, when, when people are, when the players are focusing on things that they shouldn't be focusing on, uh, and the manager's not fixing that or helping with that, then it, it's time to make a change. That's the most important thing. I mean, you can quibble with X's and O's and bullpen moves and strategy and all of that stuff. Uh, but none of that really matters in the long run. I think Charlie, um, I, I think, got a lot of fans upset because of things that, you know, he was doing that he should have been doing. You know, he, when you have three relievers that you trust, you can't pitch them every game and you can't bring them in when you're down by two in the seventh. And, you know, other people have to get out. And, and I think that's what, made a lot of fans pretty upset. Uh, the strategic off days to keep people healthy, those weren't Charlie's decisions and those are going to continue happening. Um, but keeping the players focused on the only thing that they really need to focus on, which is winning that game that day, that's what a manager has got to make sure is happening. And that wasn't happening. So, um, yeah, again, I was surprised, but yes, the change was necessary. I was a little bit shocked and and at the time I didn't I didn't understand it. I didn't like I I guess I, once you started looking into it and realizing the type of manager he was, you also can only read the newspapers. You were a lot closer to the action and to what could actually go down or or seeing it or at least analyzing it at a at a much higher level than I would, especially with your experience, but I'd always seemed, and a lot of the stuff I read was he was a friend first, a coach second. Is that does that make sense to you? No, nah, that's not true. And, okay. and I, I don't think anyone who's really down in there was uh, was saying that he he was. I mean, no, he he was not someone who was who was who was more important for him to be a friend to the players than than to be their manager. Um, no, nah, that's that's not true. I mean, he, he's, he's a wonderful guy and, and he's everybody's friend for sure, but no. Now, uh, aside from Montoyo, just, just looking at the team this year, Bo didn't make the, the, the all-star team. It seemed like it was a quite a shock for a lot of people. It wasn't extremely a shock for me. I felt like he was very inconsistent this season. What is your take on it? Yeah. Bo's not having his best season by any means. I, I, I don't think he deserved to be an all-star. I mean, a lot of people have, different view of what an all-star like who should be in the all-star game is it um people who have the best first half of the season is it people you know the stars is it uh, the, the ones who've had the great careers so if you base it on who had the best first half no Bo didn't have an all-star first half uh but he's still pretty good and oh for sure um you know he he's he's definitely hasn't been at his best yet this year and we've seen what his best can be um but but no i i i don't think that i mean they had six all-stars that's pretty impressive for a team uh that you know going into the break i mean was what seven and ten in july and only only that good because of of the big last week before the break um so yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's any controversy. I haven't heard him complain about it at all. I, I haven't heard too many of, uh, of his teammates talk about it. I, I think Bo's, there are a lot of all-star games in Bo's future. Oh, I, I completely agree. He's a phenomenal player. And, and what we saw last year with the comeback from COVID, uh, with how well all those players played together, all their batting averages, it's, it's a little bit of a different season we're seeing now with them having a full season in Canada. And, and... <clears throat> I don't know why, but for some reason, and I'm not an expert, obviously, by any means, but it almost seems like, and I'm assuming this might be for every baseball team, I'm not 100% sure, but when those guys, it, obviously, Jays are the most team I watch, but when those guys hit, it seems like they all hit. And when they have dry spells, it seems like, as a team, they suffer together. Do you think that this is such a tight-knit group of guys? They, they seem to be best friends all the time. Do you think that they have a big effect on each other when some of them aren't playing well? I think the the issue for them was that when they weren't hitting, it was because there were too many guys 
taking it upon themselves to try to turn things around for the whole team. Like if I get a big hit here, then maybe something will start rolling and maybe, you know, all of a sudden we'll start to win games because they've had, um, you know, as we sit here, they're 11 games over 500. I think they're 54 and 43 and they've had two terrible road trips that two and seven in May through New York, Cleveland and Tampa Bay. And then the one and six, uh, from in, in Oakland and Seattle. So those two road trips, they're three and 13 outside of those two road trips, they're 51 and 30, which is just stupid. Uh, good. So when, when they've been in those big ruts, uh, it's, it's been because they haven't hit for the most part, although Oakland Seattle, you could argue it was the, the pitching was really getting them down early and that makes it even, uh, bigger. Um, it makes it even more pressing for the hitters to try to get all those runs back at once. But I do think um, when things are going bad, Vlad puts it upon himself too much. Bo puts it upon himself too much. Um, and they try to be the guy who hit the five, hits the five run home run every time out. And you got to remember that, you know, they're 24 and 23 years old. And they'll grow out of that, and they they are growing out of that, and uh, and hopefully will will be more consistent over the course of the long run. Um, but it's it's definitely a good group. I don't know that everybody's best friends with everybody or, or anything like that, but uh, I do think that when multiple people are hitting, it takes the pressure off everybody else. And you know, baseball's that sport where trying harder doesn't help. Um, when you try harder, you, you wind up doing worse. It's, it's a very strange thing as far as hitting is concerned. Um, so when multiple guys are going and the pressure's off everybody else, then they'll all get going too. And, you know, even in the slumps, Alejandro Kirk was hitting Santiago Espinal was hitting, um, in the more recent slump, Lourdes Gurriel. Junior was hitting. There's always a guy or two, but when it's not five or six, then it can it can look pretty bad. Yeah. How how much of the the recent success for the Jays? Obviously, you like you said, they've been a playoff spot the whole season. Um, but as you saw in June, that little bit of a of a um, you know, lack of wins in a, in a ridiculous way of saying it. How much of the new success or, or even the past month of success would you put to, to Schneider? Oh, uh, none, uh, none at all. I mean, the players play, right? The players are the ones who are getting the job done. The players are the ones who, who succeed or fail. Um, I think John Schneider is a very good manager. Uh, I, I don't think a manager adds many wins to a team. A manager can lose games for a team, but um, but at the same point, it's, it's, it's all up to the players to perform. And um, I think Schneider is someone who has been preparing for this job for a very long time. He's managed at multiple levels. He's managed these guys a lot. And he really knows how to communicate with them. And his style of communication is much, much different than Charlie's. And so I think that helps. Um, but he's only been the manager for nine games. I, I it's hard to really put your fingerprint on a team sure. in that short a time. So I think that the change helped. Um, I think the fact that the change came when they were playing a shorthanded Kansas city team and a terrible Boston team helped a lot more than that. And that's look, that's what you do when you're a big league general manager and you're going to fire your manager you make sure that you fire that manager at a time where it's set up for the new guy to succeed right away hey everyone just a quick break from the episode here to talk about one of our newest sponsors homie gear if you've never heard of them they're pretty much the pinnacle of keeping you looking your freshest whether or not it's with shoe cleaner hat cleaner hat carrying cases or duffel bags they really have you looking fresh and clean in high quality products I just got my first product in right here and it's a 12 cap carrying case. I've got five hats in there right now and it's not even a third of the way full. I could see this thing fitting at least 15 hats of mine anyway. Um, and what I must say about it is
is that they're very high quality. I don't know about you, but I go places and I hate when my hats have wrinkles in them. If I pack them in my bag like a complete slob because I don't want to look extremely white trash pulling out a Tupperware container with my hats in it, I get creases in them and then they bug me the entire day. They don't fit right. They feel kind of wrinkled and creased and not good. And if I really want to make my wife happy, I'll stop leaving my hats all around the house on top of the fridge, on top of the dresser, on top of my dash in my car, on top of my desk, on top of the microwave, inside of the refrigerator, inside the blender. They're all over the place. It's getting out of control. That's where the 12 cap carrying case comes in handy. Not only looking at fresh as hell when you show up to an event with your hats in a proper carrying case, you've got lots of space for them all, lots of room for more, keeps them dust proof, keeps them in good shape. And, and, and the hat cleaning kits, you know how many chemicals that are out there right now that you'll try and use on your hat and it'll either like deteriorate the color or it'll make it bally. It'll smell really, really weird and chemically. They've got you covered. They've got hat cleaners, hat conditioners, shoe cleaners. They've got scrub brushes for your hats to keep them looking and feeling their best and keeping you looking your best and feeling your best. I highly recommend you check them out. That's www.homiegear.com. That's H-O-M-I-E-G-E-A-R.com. Go grab yourself a hat carrier now. If you have as much hats as me or your wife's just, you know, sick of seeing your shit, go check it out. Highly recommend. Let's get back to the episode. And Kansas okay. City, Boston definitely helps with that. And it's a very shorthanded St. Louis team. Um, so, you know, that's, that's when you make that move. Uh, I think John Schneider is going to be a wonderful manager for this team. And I think he's going to be around for a very long time. But um, I, and I don't think he would say that they're eight and one because of him. Uh, they're just playing really, really well right now. Yeah. And that was my next question. I know when they originally put John Schneider in, when Montoya was released, it was in term and it was like for this season, you do, you do believe that he'll be there for a long time in that position. I do. I, I do. I'm not quite sure why they, they made him interim. I think they have wanted him to manage for a very long time and they just didn't want to give him the job in 2019 when they knew the team was going to be awful. And they thought it was going to be awful for multiple years, which it wasn't as it turned out. Um, but I think he's the guy that they've had their eye on for, for quite a while. Um, I mean, it's just the safest thing to do is to put into rim and, and say, uh, it's just for the rest of this year. And then we're going to look, but, um, it's going to be very difficult to, to give the job to somebody else. I think after this season, that's fair. Now, now with this season, how big of an advantage do the Jays have right now having to have all other teams cross the border to play them and leave non-vaccinated players at home? Well, the only reason that it's an advantage is because all the Blue Jays are vaccinated. Um, you know, the rules go both ways. Canada, it's not a Canada rule. It's a Canada and the United States rule. And Every non-U.S. citizen playing uh, in the majors has to be vaccinated too. It's just the, uh, the Americans who, for some crazy reason make the choice not to be vaccinated and to actively harm their team and uh, you know obviously society as a whole um, so the the advantage only exists because the Blue Jays as a group were smart enough to get everybody vaccinated and uh, I have no sympathy for anybody on any of the United States uh, any of the U.S. based teams who, who chooses um to not do it. I just found it to be a, a little mind blowing, like, especially for a team like major league baseball and having teams and players that are making millions of dollars a year, just to be able to let, uh, to allow them to sit out a series just seemed ridiculous to me. Like you've got Goldschmidt not making it to this St. Louis series just cause he's not vaccinated. Like that's a big player to have missing from your lineup for a series. Yeah. Nolan Arenado too. Um, but it's not a matter of allowing them to miss the series. It's a matter of them choosing to miss the series. They don't get paid. Um, so they're, they're missing out on whatever. It's two days pay for the St. Louis guys. Uh, but it's still more money than you and I'll make in like five years. Um, but but uh, yeah, it's, what's mind boggling is when you, well, first of all, what's mind boggling is that they have all this information available to them uh, and they choose to ignore it because yeah. of 
some you know YouTube rabbit hole that they fell down into, um, or because of of bad actors who are uh, making money off of people who are uh, all of a sudden talking about you know their freedoms when they don't understand what that means. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the ridiculousness of it. But then you know when you fold that into pro sports too, it's supposed to be it's supposed to be team first and all about the team and being a good teammate and they're letting their teammates down uh, incredibly. This is it's something that that runs counter to everything we've always heard about sports and how important it is to be a good teammate. This is being a terrible teammate. Um, and you know, it's, it shows up in, in every, every visiting team pretty much that we've seen, except for the Yankees and the Astros who are all vaccinated. Uh, you know, the idea that Whit Merrifield in Kansas city would say, you know, he's making this personal choice to not be vaccinated, but if he gets traded to a contender, then he'll change his mind. Like how, how ridiculous is that? I'm unvaccinated because my team sucks. But if someone puts me on a good team, sure, I'll get it. It's it's one of the dumbest That's things I've ever heard in like a world where there's a new dumbest thing you've ever heard every 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't that accurate. But it, it it's it's frustrating because like it's so less frustrating for me. It's such a weird way to say this, but I have Maryfield and Goldschmidt on my fantasy league and seeing them go to day to day every time they need to cross. And I didn't even know that about Mary field, like that he talks about if he is playing for a better team or at least a playoff contending team, he's going to get vaccinated. That's outrageous. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. I would sit him out of spite, but uh, uh, next thing I want to talk about is um, what do you think the, 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 the biggest, um, place for improvement the Jays need to have right now? Like, is it a specific position? Is it the bullpen? Is it batting? Is it consistency? Like, where do you think the Jays need to strive for the biggest um, improvement this the rest of the season? I mean, I, I think that if they, they got a couple of big arms in the bullpen, that would help. I think that they could use another starter. I mean, you say Kikuchi's coming back, uh, and who knows what they're going to get from him. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't really see, I mean, if you can get Juan Soto, I have said before, move heaven and earth, to get Juan Soto, whatever it takes to get Juan Soto. Um, I would say that Alec Manoa, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And Alejandro Kirk are off the board, but I'm happy to talk about anybody else, um, in the entire organization. Uh, if you can get Juan Soto, you get Juan Soto. You get a 23-year-old Ted Williams, sign me up. But I don't know that that's going to happen. I think it's likelier that he winds up somewhere else. Um, so I think in the you know the smaller discussions, a starter would be great. A couple of big swing and, swing and miss arms in the bullpen would be great. And then you're set up really, really well. Where do you find, like when you say um, you said uh... – uh, Alejandro Kirk, Vladdy Guerrero, and um, Manoa, Manoa. You would you would you would set aside when when trading for Juan Soto. What is there? Certain players this season that are putting up equal numbers to Vladdy. Why do you find him so um, important to keep on this organization? Obviously, I know he's an All Star. That's not what I mean. I just how do you compare him to like the way Espinal is playing or Hernandez is hitting? Just because he's an old all around boost to the team no i mean espinal's not even in the same universe as him um i think if you look at the numbers right now vlad's ops is probably 150 points higher than espinal's um and, and hernandez had a rough rough start and he's working his way back up but no you the the reason vladdy um you, you keep vladdy at all costs is because last year he was 22 and he almost won the triple crown I mean, this, these sort of things don't happen, right? This guy is a generational offensive talent who's going to, it's crazy to say, more than likely wind up in the Hall of Fame. So when you have those guys, you don't trade them. And when they come available, like Juan Soto, you move heaven and earth to get them. So yeah, no, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but 
I mean, Santiago Espinal isn't even in the same. Um, what about if you compare him to Kirk? Vladdy and Kirk? No, Kirk to some of the other offensive starters and all stars. Kirk's hitting very well. I just know a couple of years ago, it was a little more up in the air of whether or not people like to see him on the team, especially when you had Jansen and you had, um, oh, wow, I can't even think of his name right now. You think of Gabby Moreno? No, he's still around. Yeah, he's still around. Um, Reese McGuire? Reese McGuire. At the time, like, I, obviously, I'm not trying to compare Reese McGuire to Kirk. Kirk's obviously proved himself with his team. Yeah. I'm just, I'm trying to, to compare Kirk as an offensive player. I, I'm assuming you're strictly concerned about the bats and a lot of players can play the field. It's it's really when it comes to the plate, when it matters the most, how would you compare Kirk to some of the guys that are in the field? Why would you keep Kirk over them? Again, because he's 23 years old and he's got a, a an OPS of around a thousand. and He's a catcher. Um, you know, catchers who hit are oh. extraordinarily rare. And he's become a very good defensive catcher. I mean, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of stuff he needed to work on, but he was 21 and just out of a ball. Um, he's, he's so young and so good at such a key position. Those guys are really, 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 really hard to find. I mean, Reese McGuire, there are a thousand Reese McGuire's out there. Uh, that might be a little harsh, but Reese <laughs> McGuire is, is like, nothing special he's fine he's completely fine um but really nothing special alejandro kirk is absolutely something special and again so young and so good at such a difficult position to find that in that uh yeah no um i'm i'm keeping him as long as i can Cool. And, and, and I do, I did agree with you. Like he's, he's an absolutely phenomenal baseball player and to see him hit as often as he is obviously not the same expert you are. I just wanted to get the opinion and the side of things of where you compare them to the other guys in the field, but you do make some great points and it's good to hear. That's the three exact the reason why I do this is to get someone with your professional experience and, and opinion on things just to, to get some of that insight myself. Um, when it comes to Jay's, Red Sox, Yankees. It's a weird, it seems like a weird setup right now because you've got us and the Yankees almost at the same um, uh, uh, win-loss against the Yankees, yet you've got us 10 and 3 against Boston. What What do you think, like, what do you think, uh, why do you think that is? Because Boston's terrible. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm just wondering why you think that we are losing to, to the Yankees the same amount as Boston yet we're crushing Boston. I'm just wanting to know. I think a lot of it is about when you play them, right? A lot of it is about um, uh, how teams are playing when, when, when you play them, how you're playing when you play them. I didn't realize that the, the Red Sox have a, a similar uh, one-loss record against the Yankees as the Blue Jays do. But the, the Jays, um, I don't know, maybe they, they, the Red Sox caught the Yankees at the right time. Um, but you know, Boston went through that run where they were 19 and four in June and they were playing really well, but they weren't playing anybody from the AL East. Uh, in fact, they haven't won a series against an AL East team all year. Um, so I think that, that tells you quite a bit and just looking at it wow. now. Yeah. The Yankees are six and four against Boston and eight and four against the Jays. Um, but, but when the blue Jays ran into the Yankees at one point, they were just beating everybody like crazy. And they still, I mean, they've slumped a bit in July, but they're still, uh, on pace for an incredible one loss record. Uh, but I, I just think that sort of just happens. And maybe at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the year, it'll be different. The blue Jays could wind up eight and 10 against the Yankees and the Red Sox could wind up you know, five and 13 or, or whatever it is, but it, it's tough to look at things like that individual performances, team to team, because things can just vary so wildly based on the time of year, who's in the lineup, who's healthy uh, and how the teams are playing in general. Awesome. I, I it's, it's awesome just to talk ball with someone who knows it so well, just to get a true opinion instead of just, 
I don't know, me and my buddies trying to spit facts that we have no clue what we're talking about. So it's kind of nice to get your opinion on things. Um, getting away from just the team and 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 how they're playing and how they're going to play. You you've been around like like you said, you've been at the dome. That's uh, the most place you visit other than your house in your lifetime. What are some of your best memories of it? I know it's a big change of pace, but I love going to the Rogers Center. I, I love everything about the atmosphere there. The closest I've been to the field is like 15 rows. And and what what does it mean to be so close to the organization? Like I, I don't mean to ask a thousand questions at once, but what's your what's your f- fondest memory of, of of the Rogers Center? Uh there, I mean, there's so many, right? I I I remember walking onto the field the day it opened for the first game on June 5th, 1989, and just looking around and thinking how knew everything looked and it, you know it looked like a, to- a giant toy to me um and and you know, it's great to hear that you like it so much because for so many years so many people used to call my show and tell me how terrible a place it is and it's it really isn't um but i i, I mean I'll, I'll always remember that for sure that first day um and the first game and then, then that first series when the roof closed during a game for the first time and uh, it was pouring rain, but only on home plate. So only the umpire and the home plate umpire and the batter and the catcher were getting wet. So they called uh, like a five minute delay so that the roof could finish closing. Um, <laughs> I, I remember uh, the first playoff game I was at. I don't, I wasn't there in 89. Um, I was there in 89 the, the first playoff game with the, the, uh, when Jose Canseco homered into the 500 level, um, which was directly above me. Cause I was sitting in the auxiliary press box, which was at that time, the first section of the left field seats closest to the foul line. So I saw the ball go up and I watched it and then it just disappeared and it, it wound up in the, you know, that was the first home run that was ever hit up there. Um, I, I mean, I remember, were you there for the world series? I was not there for the world series. Um, I, I still have not been, I mean, like I, I went to game one of the 93 world series as a fan, which was really cool. Oh yeah. Um, I remember being in the, the clubhouse in 91 when they clinched the AL East and they beat the angels and, um, Vince Horseman, I want to say, might have been Dwayne Ward, might have been both of them, uh, poured a beer on my head in their celebration, and that was uh, that was pretty cool. And then just you know the <laughs> getting into that broadcast booth and being a part of that broadcast was just so amazing. And working with Tom Cheek and and uh, and Alan Ashby and Joe Siddle and all these wonderful, wonderful human beings that I got to broadcast with, and you know. Calling playoff games in, in 15 and 16 was, yeah, that's what I was gonna incredible, ask. right? Um, just incredible. The, the, um, I think the three home run inning in Texas um, where Kevin Pilar hit a ball at his neck and he hit it out of the ballpark. Uh, that was amazing. When Troy Tulowitzki broke open uh, a game against Kansas City with a three-run double was incredible. Being there even though it wasn't my inning, but for the bat flip, um, when the stadium was literally shaking, I mean, there's so many phenomenal memories of, of being at that place. It can't be distilled into just one or two. It's incredible. That, that even bat last flip. year, right? Even July 30th last year, when they came home after spending uh, two thirds of the season in Dunedin and Buffalo, I was at that game. It was incredible. Yeah, it was it was mind blowing. It just yeah. felt so good to be back. <clears throat> it was um, unbelievably emotional. It was uh, it was really something else, man. And that that baffled like I can't watch a video of it because I I watched it on TV obviously at the time. My fiance was at the game, didn't even know her at that point. Um, and uh, just watching that video back of him hitting that ball like gives you goosebumps. Like just this team, this organization over the years is just. It's it's really gone up and down, up and down. I thought fifteen and sixteen was going to be our year. Just a, such a crazy, uh, a few games of just some of the biggest highlights in Jay's history over such a short period of time. Um, 
I got to say, Mike, it's, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to interview you. It, you. You're so knowledgeable in all the different aspects of the game. It's, it's, I could probably talk your ear off about different aspects of the game for hours, but, uh, we don't have that much time. So I just, I just wanted to, to, to end things by thanking you for, for coming on here, small town podcast. I know you've been in town before. I talked to some, uh, some buddies of mine that said that you come to, uh, do some press, uh, years back. I don't know if you ended up remembering that, but. Oh, of course. Uh, pitch talks was, was a lot of fun, uh, to come out to, to Tavistock and, and do that, uh, two or three times. I, you know, I, I wish they would start, start that stuff up again. I'm, uh, I, I talk every once in a while to the guy who organized it and trying to push him to like, let's go back. Let's, let's do another tour. Uh, it was so much fun to, to yeah. hit those small towns and I would, I would love to, to come back. Absolutely. They still talk about it. Like I'm, I'm on the optimist club now. So I, I hear all the guys that happen to be a part of it at the time. And they're like, they, they would love anything to do with you guys coming back. It was a, it was definitely a big memory of theirs for sure. Mine too. Absolutely. So I just wanted to end things off. I usually let people plug uh, where they can be followed. Um, if you want to get some, uh, some baseball insight, if they want to follow your podcast, I know your podcast is deep LF podcast on Twitter. It's uh, deep left field on everywhere else. You get your favorite podcast. Your Twitter is Wilnerness. That's W I L N E R N E S S. Is there anywhere else that people can find you? Yeah, it's the Toronto Star. I mean, you. you uh, oh yeah, your articles. Uh, if if Toronto anyone Star. wants to write, um, anybody wants to subscribe to the Star wherever you are, right? Digitally, we were talking about that before, so yep. um, you can get all my stuff sent right to your inbox. Um, so yeah, we we love any new subscribers. Go to the Star uh, dot com and uh, and sign up, but uh, and subscribe to the podcast too. That's a uh, it's a blast doing deep left field we've got ross stripling on every week uh and a whole bunch of uh of different guests i'm hoping to talk to tyler o'neill today who is on uh, the st louis cardinals he's from burnaby bc um <clears throat> big baseball canada guy so uh hopefully that will happen for this week's episode and a, a new one comes out every thursday and uh yeah the more people listen to that the better so if, if you're if you listen to podcasts and if you're listening to this one then obviously you do um subscribe to deep left field as well yeah and i and everyone i do recommend uh, uh subscribing to deep left field i've listened to a handful of episodes and it's it's really good to get up to date information on the team you, you you see what you see in the media go check out toronto star and see his articles that, that release but every thursday you'll get to hear about when, when Montoya was released and what's going on with pitchers and, and obviously stripling goes on all the time. It's a joy to hear you talk to the players on like a more personal level than, than, than the camera in the face kind of stuff. So yeah, go check it out again, Mike, I truly appreciate your time today. It was an absolute blast. And thank you so much for joining me on a heart to heart. Oh, happy to do it. Thanks for having me.